in Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13, we find the Lord's Prayer. And if you're turning there in your Bibles, if you have one, or your your phone or your iPad or whatever. Now, you notice I have my, I have my phone up here today. So I'm not going technical, <clears throat> but there's no clock back there anymore. And I need something. So I'm praying that my sister doesn't keep texting me. I just want to fill up my screen. My, my time will disappear. I told her to pray for me this morning because I was preaching, and she now she's texting me. So uh, <laughs> it should be a little more ex- definitive about what I want her to do. Pray, not text. Don't text. Pray. But how many of you know that preachers don't really have a good sense of timing? <laughs> we know that because Pastor Joel preached last week. So... <laughs> Yeah, he did better the second service, but and and I can I definitely don't know what time it is unless I have something in front of me. So hence the 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 iPhone. So the Lord's Prayer, let's read it. Pray then like this, Matthew six, verse nine. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I love that because this is how Jesus taught his disciples to pray. And when Jesus says something, it just seems to have a little more weight. Probably in reality, the Holy Spirit's working through all the writers of the Gospels is really the same. But for me, when Jesus says it, it's kind of like there's something special. This is how we're supposed to pray. As I was thinking about the message today, and these series on relationships, it reminded me of when I was in veterinary school. And we were in this season where we were learning things by systems. And so with each system, we'd have the specialist of that system come in. So if it was a cardiovascular system, we'd get the cardiovascular guy. If it was the neurologic, get the neurologic, the respiratory, and so forth. And at the beginning of each series of lectures from that specialist, they would begin by stating how their system was really the most important system in the body because without that system, you could not live. And of course, that was true for every system, right? (laughs) Because we need them all. So it became kind of the standing joke as we, each person would come in and try to pitch their system as being the most important, the most exciting, the most entertaining, the most whatever. So as I was thinking about the series today and we're you probably realize we're talking about our father and relationships. Arguably, this could be the most important relationship you'll ever have. <laughs> and having said that, however, as, as perfect as God's relationship was with Adam, God recognized that Adam needed something more. It's not good for man to be alone. So the reality is that even though we might look at this as being the most important relationship. All of our relationships are critical for our life, for our function. They all interrelate. So if you didn't hear the last two week sermons, I would highly encourage you to listen to those. So relationships, what, what about relationships? Listen, there's something intriguing about them because they can be the most rewarding thing in life. And they can be the most challenging. They can be awesome. They can be catastrophic. They can be exciting. They can be devastating. And everybody here knows that because you're over four years old. You've (laughs) experienced all of those things in relationships, the difficulties and the excitement. The number one thing about relationships is they're essential. We cannot get away from them. They're necessary for life. We, we know from science, from study, that newborn babies, children growing, fail to thrive without relationship. They will die, literally die unless they're touched, they're held, they're talked, and they have to have input. It's required. So what, what's the number one thing that we have to do with a relationship is communication. Communication Without communication, it has to be some sort of communication or you don't have a relationship. You don't communicate verbally. You don't communicate with hand, hand language, something. 
you don't have a relationship. So what's communication in and of itself can be very difficult, second only to relationships. And we have to have both of them to survive. So how do we, how do we deal with this? this? I was feeling sorry for this fella that was on, made national news. You, some of you probably saw it. Right before Hurricane Irma came into Florida, they were broadcasting on TV what for people to do. And so they, they needed someone that did sign language to communicate to the deaf. And they couldn't find anyone that was certified. So they found this guy that his brother was deaf, he signed language, but he wasn't certified, but he volunteered his services. Now, most of us had no idea what he was signing, but for the deaf, <coughs> uh, he was actually making quite a few mistakes. Things like, uh, there were things in there, this is a, a natural, national, statewide emergency, and he's talking about pizza. Uh, he's talking about different things that just aren't really making sense. <laughs> and uh, you got to feel sorry for him because he's just like, I'm just volunteering because there's nobody else to do it. And now he's, you know, they're asking for apologies and all this stuff. It's like, so communication can be difficult. Amen? You know, what happens is, our language in and of itself is imperfect. We find just translation from the Greek and the Hebrew very, very different. We have multiple words for one word in the English language, and so we have that, we have that issue. But even more challenging, I believe, is that when God created us, somewhere between creation and, the, and after the fall, I think something happened where we became imperfect. I think that God created Adam perfect, but somehow now we're not perfect. And I, I love studying and understanding how God created us because it's really interesting to me. But we, when we look at certain systems, like our special senses especially, and we look at, say, vision. So just look at vision. When you think about vision, when you see something, are you seeing it with your eyes? Our natural instinct is that, yes, we're seeing it with our eyes. However, it's really our brain that composes an image that we see with our eyes. Our eyes just transmit, and it's really just electrical signals, and then we have this image, and it's amazing, really, how that happens. I don't think we understand how that happens any more than we understand how the sound that comes through our ears and just hits a little hammer and anvil and all that stuff and makes an electrical impulse, and then we have sounds, and they make syllables, and they make names and they make sentences and we can communicate. But how many of you know that that's, those systems are not perfect? Okay. What happens with our vision, for instance, is that our brain processes everything we see. So things that are repetitive in nature, especially, our brain will actually create what they call percepts. They'll create blocks of information. So you might see something for instance, when you're reading, you might read, <clears throat> and your brain actually figures out words, whole words, without reading every, uh, every letter. And, but so sometimes you can be reading, you actually see a word and read a word and go back and realize that you misread that word because your brain actually created, but from a percept, it created a word that really wasn't there because it saw something that reminded it of another word. And that happens. Ever happened to you? It happens to me. Maybe it's just because I'm getting older. I don't know. But it's a reality. It's a fact. When you, when you actually, and your brain does other things. So when you actually bring colors together, different colors, you can actually literally see those colors change right before your eyes. And yet the colors, it's the same color. But your brain is processing. When... When a doctor reads a radiograph, and we did, what's appalling to me is we did not know this until 20 years ago, 25 years ago. We did not know this. So doctors are reading your radiographs 30 years ago. They did not know this. There are things you see on the radiograph that are not there because your brain puts it there because it says it should be there, 
and it's not, it puts it there. There are lines, there are images on x-rays that are not there. And you can prove it by running it through a computer and a sensing. So what happens is if we don't know these things, we can interpret incorrectly what we see. You all heard what seeing is believing. Don't believe it. <laughs> it's not always true. It's why two people can see an accident and have opposing stories and are both telling the truth, and yet they seem like somebody must be lying because they saw something different, and your brain processes this. So here, so we have, so you're getting the picture. We have relationships that are already by their nature difficult. We have communication as part of that, and communication in and of itself has these problems. We have the inherent problems of communication. What we hear, how many of us, if you've been married long enough, you can finish your wife's sentence? Don't do it. You could, but don't. Just don't, because it really makes her mad. She doesn't want you to do that. She wants you to listen. But we'll hear things, and again, some of this could be age and not hearing as well, but sometimes we have percepts about what we hear, and we are sure we know what we heard, but it's not what they said. We have to have some grace and with relationships, amen. We have to have that. Now, you add to that. Okay, just for instance, a newborn. We have a granddaughter that's going to be born here in a few weeks. And I can promise you, everybody's going to be Googling over her and talking to her, and they'll be doing it for, for hours and days and months. And it'll take that little girl months before she finally starts saying, like, da-da. That's what, that's what she's going to say first, because that's what's most important. <laughs> they'll say, da-da. <clears throat> and eventually they'll say, mama. <laughs> but it takes years to master a language for them to understand. We have a two-year-old and a four-year-old. Four years, getting it down pretty good. A two-year-old's still working on it. Mostly on her talking to us. We're actually still working on it. We're trying to figure it out. What is she saying? And then we, we have a relationship with the Father. So the Lord's Prayer says, Our Father. So immediately, we have, there's actually percepts that immediately pop into our minds depending on our relationship with our Father, our experiences with our Father, and, and it goes on and on and on. In heaven, percepts pop up. Our Father, we might feel a very close personal connection to. In heaven feels like that's a little bit out of reach. And yet they're in the same sentence. Hallowed or holy is your name. That definitely feels like there's a wall. I'm not holy. I'm not hallowed. But he's holy. And if I'm not perfect, in fact, he might even be angry with me. We can have these percepts, these perceptions, these things. And so we have this challenge of how do we have a relationship with our Father who's in heaven, who's holy. How do we do that? And then we, we see the rest of that prayer kind of give us some insight. He says, uh, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses for those who trespass against us and deliver us from evil. Lead us not into temptation. And so we see that we have personal things that he wants to engage with us. You see that he's got a will and he's willing. He's willing. I remember when I was in undergraduate college and I was in a farmhouse fraternity, as it was called, and so we had a lot of young men. But we had a lot of professors and administration that we, um, we had relationship with in our house, and so they come, they, they eat with us, they share with us, and I remember this, this one gentleman that was elderly at the time, probably younger than me now, <laughs> but Major Todd, and he was a devout Christian, and he made this statement, and, and this was shortly after I got saved, he, and there were several of us gathered around, and he said, God is number one in my life. My wife is number two. My children are number three. Something like that. And I remember being a little bit shocked 
by that. And a little bit, how is that possible that God is really number one in your life, that you love God more than your wife? I wasn't married yet. Um, that followed a few years later. When it did, <clears throat> when, it, when I did get married, I kind of kept that under my hat. <clears throat> I was like, mm, I don't think I want to tell my wife that she's number two. <laughs> Not sure that would go over that well. If you haven't been married yet, I want to keep it under your hat. <laughs> <laughs> but even at that point in my life, I w the reality of that then started to hit home. Is God really number one in my life, or is it my wife? I, I really, at that point, didn't have the feelings and the understanding, even at being a Christian for a few years, of how this relationship with God works. It actually took me quite a few years to understand that God really did want and desire a personal relationship with me, a personal relationship with me. I didn't know that. I mean, depending on what stream of Christianity you walk in, you might even have different opinions on that. There's all kinds of things about, you know, most of that's just first century and God doesn't talk to us. And I mean, you, you tell people God talks to you and you might, they might start committing you to the Looney Tunes or they're looking at you a little crazy. So, but, but I found out that God does talk to us and God does want to communicate and God wants a relationship. Now, when I got married and I had met Cindy a few times and we'd had some interactions in grade school, junior high, high school, and, but we got married when we were about 23 but what I didn't know about her and her family was that they, they skied. They skied their, their whole life. They had pictures of skiing. They had all their outfits. They uh, were uh, pictures were little kids and growing all the way up through high school. And they lived at the base of Schweitzer, so it was convenient for them to go. And they would hitchhike up Schweitzer, and they would, you know, drive cars up without oil in the engines. And they'd <laughs> get to, you know, coast them down the mountain because they wouldn't run anymore, all kinds of stories about skiing. And me, I was not raised in a skiing family. My, my family didn't ski, and we were doing different things. But when I was a senior in high school, and the school had a program, so you could ski. You could learn how to ski. So I thought, better do it now, or I'm never going to do it. So needless to say, between that and college, I never really got a lot of skiing under my belt. Skied enough to kind of maybe leave the beginning stages, but skied with some of my friends, but I, I like to be, I like to challenge myself. So, you know, hey, look out, because here I come. So I might not have a lot of control, but I could get down the mountain. <laughs> so the first time I went skiing with my wife, I was going to go, I wanted to go ski a little bit of powder, some moguls. Uh, she was skiing the groomed runs. And I, Oh, well, okay, so do you want to ski some moguls? Do you want to ski some? No, all I ski is groom runs. And in my mind, I'm thinking, you've been skiing your whole life, so why would you ski just groom runs? I kind of didn't compute for me. Now that I, we've been married all these years, I know her better. I understand her a lot better. I'm not saying I'm in there yet, <laughs> but... Now it actually makes sense to me why she skied just groom runs. Because I know her better. That's her consistent with her nature and her personality. Ski the groom runs. So we have a story, and I want to go back to the prodigal son. Because we kind of started the summer off with this. But I want to go to the end of that story because I want to look at a situation where there's relationship issues with the father. And we know the beginning of the story, the young son who takes his inheritance, he leaves, he squanders it, he comes back, the father receives him, he has a party. But let's look at the end of that story because oftentimes I feel like we neglect the story that's there. And so it's in Luke chapter 15, verse 25, and I'm going to pick up this story of the older son, who is unaware that his younger son has actually returned. And he's coming in from the fields. He's working. So 
So as now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf, because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Now see, the common thing we do is we say, well, that's, that's for the Pharisees. That's really the Pharisee in this story. And then we can kind of shrug that off. But the reality is I think that it goes way beyond being a Pharisee. I think it goes beyond that. And if you look at the reality of this story and just take the Pharisee part out, just put yourself in there, your younger brother and your father in a real-life situation. And as Christians, we, we love the prodigal son because we see the heart of the father. But what if you're the older brother and you're dealing with this son of his, not my brother, <laughs> that you have to cope with this. I mean, if we're honest with ourselves, we're going to probably have some issues. I would. Seems like the older brother actually has some legitimate claims. I mean, the father never even slaughtered the goat for him. How many of you, when you think of a party, want to have a goat for, you know, lunch, dinner? <laughs> I don't know about you, but I don't know if I've ever had goat, but I, I don't even care if I ever have goat. And I, I, I've had goat milk. I don't like that. I know that. And if you don't tell me it's goat cheese, I might like it. But if you tell it, I, I may not. And so, I, you know, the, the younger brother got prime rib. He got the fattened calf. He got the calf that's been prepared for the party. And yet the younger bro the older brother who's, who's been faithful, he's never left, he's been obedient, he's worked his whole time. What did he get? And he sees the injustice that appears to him, the comparison between him and his brother. You see the what happens here is that he doesn't really know his father. He doesn't really know his father's heart. He's been skiing the groom runs his whole life. He hasn't gotten any deeper because he hasn't needed to. And all of a sudden, the younger brother comes back and he has to deal with things. The father is... He lost his younger son. His younger son comes back. He's having a big party. He got his son back, and now his older son's mad at him. Your parents ever felt like that? <laughs> Sometimes you can't win for losing. And then you say, well, maybe the father should have done a better job, but yet we know the father in this story is, is God. What did God do wrong? What he's really saying to this, the older son is, listen, you have everything I own is yours. You have been with me the entire time. What more could you want? It's not always just about us. And that's the hard lesson sometimes. Sometimes it's about somebody else. Sometimes it's about the other person that's hurting. And... Sometimes it's just about getting to know the Father better. Do we understand everything that the Father does? 
No. But if we have a relationship with the Father, and we're working on that, and we understand, at least in principle, that, that God the Father is looking out for our best interests, that he's there for us when the hard things in life come, can we cope with that? Can we deal with that? When we had been married some 14, 15 years, my wife started, as many of you know, um, dealing with clinical depression. And at first, it was she kind of hid it, and she was hiding it. And, but it got, as things got worse and worse and worse, and the marriage was rocky and was tough because you're just dealing with so many things. The marriage is hard even when relationships are good, but when you're dealing with clinical depression, and there's a whole nother reality to life, and it's, it's very difficult. <clears throat> and I remember <clears throat> in one of those moments where it really looked like our marriage was not going to make it. But because I had a relationship with the Father, I could go to Him. A couple of weeks ago, Stephen mentioned that. Listen, you may not think you need relationships right now, but someday you will need those relationships. You don't want to wait for that someday. You want to be in relationship before. <clears throat> and I remember I said, Lord... And honestly, I've had more answers to prayer when I'm just standing and being honest before God than when I'm just on my knees and praying for 45 minutes. <clears throat> because God sees our heart. And I said, Lord, I really believed. And I was certain that you brought Cindy and I together to be husband and wife. So I'm a little confused because right now it doesn't look like we're going to make it. So was I wrong? Did I get that right or wrong? Or, because I know you don't like divorce. So what's going on? And I'll never forget because right then, the Lord spoke to me. And he said, <clears throat> for such a time as this. For such a time as this. <clears throat> Most of the time, the Lord will speak to you in Scripture. And what that does is it, one phrase can bring you back to where that Scripture is found in Esther, and you realize what that means. What that means is that your misery, this misery that you're in, is actually your ministry. For such a time as this, God is not taken by surprise. He knew this was going to happen. He did bring us together. And for such a time as this, she needs you. She needs you right now. If you, you believe that God brought you together in your marriage, if you're married, then, you know, listen, things can go south, and it takes two to make things work. <clears throat> but God unites us that we can minister to one another, even in the hard times. We have to decide to trust. Are we going to trust the Father? Did I understand everything that's happening? No. Do I even now understand it? No. But I trusted God because I knew I could, because he'd been faithful before, and he'd always been faithful. I trusted him. There came a point in time later where <clears throat> things got worse before they got better. Listen, it didn't get better just because I got a word from the Lord. Not for a while. There came a time later where she was so miserable. I mean, she was so miserable that I literally said, Lord, I have to release her to you. 
have to release her. I have to give her to you. I have to trust her in your hands because there's nothing I can do. And if it means taking her to be with you, then I, I release her for that. And I was serious. You see, the Lord's Prayer, our Father in heaven, <clears throat> hallowed be your name, but your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I always thought that just meant when Jesus comes again, his will will be done on earth as, as it is in heaven. That's what we're praying for. But it was kind of a revelation for me that in reality, I believe that what God's will in heaven that's being done and he wants it to be done on earth is he is doing that through us. We are his ministers to bring about his will on earth. And that's our call. It's not always about us. Do we understand the Father's heart? We have things to do. And sometimes the very things that we're working through, the difficult things, the things that we want to be, we don't understand are actually our ministry. I remember Joel last week, he talked about if you have a physician and you go to him and he has a horrible bedside manner, you know, you're probably not going to go back, right? You remember that? So I was kind of chuckling to myself because I've had a, a few doctors and I, I've had a couple back surgeries and I was getting ready for my second back surgery and I had some clients that had just, he had had a back surgery by this very doctor and we were talking and he, was, he told me, he said, well, he did a great job. He's a great surgeon. Um, doesn't really have a great bedside manner. And I said, I don't care what the bedside manner is, honestly. <laughs> I want the best surgeon that's putting a knife to my back. That's who I want. The rest of it I really don't care about. We might think sometimes God's bedside manner is not that great, honestly. <clears throat> Really, we, we don't always agree with his bedside manner, but he's the best we have. He's, he is the best surgeon. He's the best physician. He knows what he's doing. Believe it or not, he really knows what he's doing. <clears throat> and our relationship with our Father, whatever that is, and I encourage you to develop it because it's like being a newborn, when we, when we come to the Father, because He's in heaven, because He's hallowed, because He's holy, He's spirit. And it's like learning a whole other language. And we start as newborns, and it doesn't just happen overnight. It's a process of years of, of listening and talking and worshiping and studying and hearing and seeing and experiences of life that develop this relationship. What relationship among you is strong and vibrant and healthy that hasn't had to be worked at? It hasn't taken time. I know Cindy didn't like it when I said this, but I said, I hope I love you more in 30 years than I love you now. She, she never really liked that, but... <laughs> so... <clears throat> but... Honestly, that, I want to love her more next year than I love her now. I want my love to grow. I want, it to, I want a relationship to deepen. I want it to be better, not worse, not the same. We want it to, to get better. I want that with my father because I haven't arrived yet. In Philippians uh, chapter 3, I think as an example of someone who really got it was Paul, the apostle Paul, because he kind of walked both sides of the fence unknowingly at first, but he really understood this relationship with God as well as anybody did. And he wrote this in Philippians chapter 3, verse 3. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself 
have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and he and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by all means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Our relationship with our Father in heaven defines who we are. It creates an identity in Christ that I believe that we all should be seeking for. Who am I in Christ? Because in this day and age, we, we suffer with identity crisis. We really do. Our, our culture, our society is in a crisis of identity. And yet it's defined, it's laid out in Scripture. Who we really are. It's not who the world says you are. Who does God say you are? That's what's important. And when you take that with you, and you really believe it, and you've cemented it with a relationship with him and Christ, that it really changes how you walk, changes how you think, changes how you act, changes what you believe. It really can change you fundamentally who you are.